So, so it, it's thorning. And, and I, you know, you know, I think when we talk about qualities that are feminine and qualities that are masculine, there, there are probably some elements of that that are just uh, purely kind of cultural stereotypes. Yeah. But I think there might be some elements in there too that we could say, well, no, that, that is more associated with women where mm. that quality is. I mean, we know that men in general are more aggressive than women. Yeah. And we know, you know, there's a big body of research that shows that women tend to be more agreeable than men. Yeah. Welcome to another episode of Mind the Shift. My name is Anders Bolling. When Western science began delving into the depths of the non-physical aspects of a human being, after the previous devia- deviation from uh, spiritual matters which were left to religion, to the church, it was in the form of psychology. Sigmund Freud and Carl Gustav Jung are considered to be the founders of modern psychoanalysis. Jung's version is known as analytical psychology. And the two were friends, by, but bit by bit, Jung moved away from Freud's ideas and developed theories about the unconscious that are bordering on the mystical. And today, exactly 60 years after Carl Gustav Jung's death, there are psychologists and psychoanalysts who label themselves Jungians. Uh, Jung was actually one of my own uh, earliest intellectual acquaintances on my own spiritual journey, and his work was a source of inspiration to me. My guest today is Lisa Marciano. She is a Jungian analyst, author, and a podcaster. Her writings have appeared in numerous publications. She's the co-host and creator of the popular depth psychology podcast, This Jungian Life. She is on the faculty of the C.G. Jung Institute of Philadelphia and lectures and teaches widely. And she lives with her family in Philadelphia, United States. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you, thanks for having me. I hope I pronounced your, your last name right there, Marciano. You did, you did, yes. I was thinking maybe if it's Italian, it's, it should be a K sound, but... <laughs> That's right, but we're in the United yeah. States, so... Yes, okay. So, Carl Gustav Jung, fascinating uh, person. Would you say that Jung was primarily a psychologist or primarily... A, some kind of a spiritual teacher, or are the two only different aspects of the same approach to life as you see it? Well, I think that Jung tried to, you know, uh, James Hollis uh, has made, he's a Jungian analyst uh, and a writer, and he's made the point that uh, depth psychology, so depth psychological understandings such as those uh, espoused by Freud and Jung, really, really needed to uh, come into creation right around the time that it did, because it was then that there was this real shift, this sort of death of God phenomenon, when you know ordinary religions were increasingly uh, not working for people as a container for numinous experience or a way to relate to the infinite, and so you know then we get depth psychologies that are that are interested in these deeper layers. Jung, uh, I think in, in, in one sense, you can see his life's work as an attempt to marry or at least reconcile science and, and mysticism, I would yeah. say, or, or a religious sensibility. Hmm. So, I, and I think he, he consciously saw himself as standing at that intersection. Hmm. That's a worthy endeavor, I'd say. Uh, I, I have to tell also the audience here, the listeners, that you, there's a sound they can hear, a beautiful sound. There are some birds chirping in the background there because uh, the temperature in Lisa's office is 95 degrees Fahrenheit, about 34 degrees Celsius. So the windows open. Is open. Yeah. So <laughs> if anybody is wondering, uh, does, does a Jungian hate a Freudian? 
and vice versa? Um, no, no, definitely not. I, I can't. What's speak your relationship to, to Sigmund Freud? Well, uh, as as in my Jungian training, I was responsible for learning about Freud's ideas, and uh, there are many schools of thought, kind of post Freudian schools of thought, that we Jungians, or at least the Jungians I know draw upon all the time. I was originally, my original training was in object relations, which is a kind of post Freudian school of thought. And uh, we are interested in and refer to all the time people that follow from that tradition, like um, uh, um, Winnicott and um, Melanie Klein and Beyond. And so uh, I, I think that a union view can really encompass a lot of other schools and we're we're very and again this is my experience of in my training institute and unions that I know we're very interested in other schools and understanding how they touch into union thought and even incorporating um, other schools of thought into union thought. I have colleagues who are really steeped in Freud even even though their unions are very steeped in Freud and they um, kind of uh, use a lot of of Freudian ideas. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think in some sense the uh, antagonism between the two schools of thought perhaps has been overplayed. But, um, you know, union thought is not, it's delightfully not long off. You know, it's delightfully it's not, not well, say, say that again. It's likely not. It's it's delightfully not walled off. Okay. It's, okay. It's not territorial. Yeah. Not walled off. Yeah. Yeah. But I get the impression that Freudian the, the Freud's ideas are are waning today these days, and they were more popular 30, 40 years ago than today. Or maybe that's wrong. No, I maybe, think that's Maybe I'm true. biased because I'm more into Jung myself. I mean, this is this is my view. I'm about to give you my view on it, which could be yeah. totally wrong. But here's here's what I think. So, in the early years, uh, sort of the mid up to about the middle of the 20th century, Freud really dominated the academy. Most psychiatrists had a Freudian um, leaning. Um, there were Freud really really permeated the culture. Most of kind of what we consider psychoanalytic thinking was Freudian, um, and Jung was, you know, I don't want to say, you know, then the, then there was this other stream of Jungian, but but it's but if, if there was sort of like a battle for the academy, Freud won it. Yeah, you know, you didn't learn Jung when you went to uh, school to become a therapist. You, you really learned Freud. So then the medical model came in and really kind of knocked psychoanalysis out. And, and so interest in psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalytic practice and, tra and training has been somewhat waning in like mainstream psychiatry. And it's just not true anymore that most psychiatrists also get poor in training. You know, that's kind of a little bit of a relic. Um, but I think all the time there's been percolating along a kind of consistent interest in Jungian thought, beside all of these other uh, ebbs and flows in, mm. in culture. And you know, if you look at kind of, if you just look at books, for example, in the fifties, um, I, I think it was in the fifties that Joseph Campbell published *Hero with a Thousand Faces*. Mm. which has done, you know, it's been in print ever since, and it's very, very influenced by Jung. Yeah. And then there, you know, there were some important books that came out in the 60s that were written by Jung and his colleagues. And then in the 80s, there was this sort of, you know, uh, another explosion. People like Robert Johnson were writing very popular books. The 90s saw yet another kind of burgeoning interest in it with Best-selling books. That, that's like when James. I came came in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me too. James Hillman and Chris Pinkola Estes and yeah. Linda Leonard and a lot of popularizers out in the culture. I have a couple of books here. <laughs> I, I guess my, my I think my this is in Swedish. Yes. It's just these are just pocket books. I think my ex-wife got the bulk of the the young books that we had. <laughs> I think we had about ten of them. Uh huh. So it somehow I you know it it never. 
and then in the in the 2000s there were um books on well the red book came out and it was that like 2009 i think 2008, 2009. The, the what the, the red book young's red book okay okay mm-hmm. which was like a surprise bestseller and um and uh you know just just sort of and and it's you know it's just sort of a phenomenal showing for a book like that a very expensive yeah. Yeah. portfolio type book but has sold really really well Interesting. and um you know and and james hollis is writing during that time period so i, I just think there's a perennial interest in young yeah. that that doesn't necessarily follow the mainstream cultural trends but no. s- people find something in this mm. school of thought that really feeds them i mean just to, to wrap up here i don't want to go on for too long but I've made this point before, you know, Deb, Joseph, and I started the podcast. It was just for fun. Like, we really didn't think anything was going to happen with it. It was really just like, oh, let's just try this. It'll be fun. It'll be like a fun thing to do together. Mm. And it just almost immediately kind of took off. It was shocking. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I like we're, we're like, you know, I don't know, maybe kind of sort of interesting people, but we're not that interesting. <laughs> and I, I think uh, and really the podcast what, is pretty deep, isn't it? I think the podcast is so popular because people are hungry for these ideas. Yeah. Yes, and and that's that's my impression too. That one of the reasons why maybe Freud is is uh, waning into the background and and Jung is getting more popular because people have a longing for the more spiritual aspects of life, yes. which Freud actually didn't have, and he was more a person who resonated with uh, very scientifically. Um, uh tuned people earlier in the in the in the 20th century and so yeah he actually he actually um felt very suspicious of the kind of more mystical stuff and warned young about that yeah, yeah. and and he's also he, he never freud i mean just to briefly explain the difference the main difference between freud and jung's freud never spoke about a collective unconscious so that's right it's more individualistic and more down to earth more materialistic perhaps i think that mm, I, I, it's not fair because i mean he did you know one of freud's real important contributions is is this idea that there is an unconscious yeah true you know so i don't i don't was, and but, his work I, on dream dream interpretation mm-hmm, is also very mm-hmm, groundbreaking mm-hmm. It was was he? Can we call him a materialist? I don't know. I'd have to think about that more. Yeah. What? But what do you say when pe- people ask you what's the difference between Freud and Jung? Maybe you haven't had that question. Oh God, before. no, I have that question a lot. So I mean, I think there are two main differences. I think uh, that are related to each other. One is the one you already mentioned: is the way they viewed the unconscious. And so Freud viewed the unconscious as you know roughly similar to kind of like a landfill. <laughs> it's uh-huh. where things go that have never quite made it to consciousness things that we've forgotten or repressed, it's kind of the refuse bin. Yeah. And and uh, Jung, uh, Jung thought that, yes, that's an adequate explanation of the personal unconscious. But beneath the personal unconscious, Jung posited that there was this collective unconscious, this kind of universal substrate to which we're all connected. He also said that, whereas, whereas uh, you know, Freud felt that the, unconscious sort of needed to be repressed or kind of conquered by ego or kind of colonized by ego and and it you know there there was stuff that you had to kind of repress you know uh it urges and that kind of thing um Jung said well you know yeah there's some there's some stuff that's that's bad or messy in the unconscious certainly but the unconscious can also also give rise to startling new creative impulses so the unconscious is creative. Mm. The, the other difference between them that a lot of people may be aware of is this notion of the nature of libido. Freud felt that essentially all energy was sexual energy and that um, one of the most important drives was the sex drive. And Jung felt that uh, energy was much more, um, so what I would like to use, like less defined by that. Yeah. He used libido in terms of just like psychic energy. 
that could be available for any number of uses. Mm. And he also felt that there was, yeah, of course there's a sexual instinct. And, but he also thought that there was a creative instinct and a religious instinct. Mm. So the libido is just one of many, many energy drivers. Well, it's, gen- it's a general energy. Yeah. In Jungian thought, libido is general psychic energy. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, what, what was it that made you choose this pretty narrow path of becoming mm-hmm. a Jung- Jungian analyst? I mean, you were, you were about to become a lawyer. You yes. Know, to me. So yes. what happened? <laughs> Um, so in my twenties, I worked in the field of international relief and development, and I worked for NGOs in Washington. And I was like, oh, I should, you know, let, let me go back and get a law degree. So I, you know, I wanted to do international humanitarian human rights and uh, that kind of thing. And I, I got a, a master's in international affairs, and I was supposed to start the JD, but I was 28, and uh, you know. I thought I didn't know about Saturn return at that point, but I found out about it later. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, that's interesting. That's around that time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I, and actually, I mean, that's just, that is such a time for, for people. I think that age 30 transition. And I just, I just, honestly, I just fell into a depression and I didn't understand it and I couldn't make sense of it. And my, my sort of famous story, which continues to feel really meaningful to me is that year I was living in Manhattan and, um, and I, I was, I was, as I said, I was depressed. I didn't really understand it. I didn't really know what to do about it. I used to wander over to this independent bookstore that was just like half a block from my apartment. And I'd go downstairs. I just kind of always wind up in the psychology self-help section. I was studying international affairs. <laughs> so this is interesting, right? That I'm always going to the psychology self-help section. Yeah, yeah. And there was this book on the shelf. It's right behind me now called On the Way to the Wedding. And uh, I thought, you know, something about that title intrigued me. So I would pick it off the shelf. Maybe you can find it behind you. It's right here. There it is. There it is. On the Um, Way to the Wedding. By Linda Leonard. Yeah. Um, So I'd pick it off the shelf and I'd open it to any page. And it didn't matter where I opened it to. I would read a few lines and I'd start crying. (laughs) Oh, that's and I I think, oh, I should buy this book. And I think I've got 400 pages of reading to do on, you know, international affairs. I can't, I can't buy a book. Like I can't do that. So I put it back in the shelf. And I mean, I must have done that four times, at least, at least four times. The same book. Okay. And then one day I woke up and I just had this sinking feeling like just everything was wrong. And I just, I just tried everything to get myself out of it. I tried to call a friend and meet for brunch didn't work i i tried to be a walk didn't work i went for a run in central park didn't work i went to the museum of natural history because i love that museum it didn't work i was just i i just as depressed as i've ever been and i just couldn't get out of it and i went to that bookstore and i went downstairs and i pulled this book off the shelf and i opened it to a page and i started crying and i thought i should buy it, and then i put it back on the shelf <laughs> But then on my way home, I crossed Columbus Avenue and there was this little new age gift shop right across the street from the bookstore. You know, the kind of place that sells like crystals and incense. And mm-hmm. and at the back, they had like maybe a dozen books on the shelf. And this was one of the books. Oh, really? And I thought, okay, I don't know that I knew the term synchronicity, so but I knew I- like... It's a sign. Like you got to buy the book. Yeah. So I I bought the book. This is the copy that I bought, and I got it back to my apartment, and saw that it is a. I don't know if you can see that. It's a signed copy. Oh, it's a signed copy. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So, yeah, like so that was like wow. So I started reading this book, and and suddenly the clouds parted, because I I. It gave me, I think, what 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 we know we what I now know we need when we're suffering. It gave me a different perspective on my suffering. You know, Jung said we don't solve our problems so much as grow larger than them. Mm. And that book was like I I'd been down in the muck, and that book was like someone taking my hand and leading me up to the hilltop so that I could look down on what was going on for me. 
yeah. didn't take it away, but I had a totally different relationship with it. Mm. And I, I think I knew at the end, of the book, or maybe even before the end, mm. that I needed to do this. So you, you just, you just switched careers immediately after having read that book. Then it took, it took a number of years. It okay. took a number of years, and I, I, um, well, I didn't go to law school though. <laughs> I, I thought, oh, I can't do that. No. So I, I went and I actually, so this was 1994, 1994. So in, in Bosnia, and I did that for two years. And while I was in Bosnia, I was reading a lot of books by analysts and just letting this all be there. And, uh, you know, obviously really engaged in, in the work there. But, but uh, in my free time, I was reading stuff like that. And, and then at the end of it, I sort of made a decision. Am I going to go back and go to law school or am I going to take this other path? So I, I get, it was a, it was like a two year decision for, uh, process, at least two years before then deciding to go to social work school instead of law school. Mm. Beautiful. I, I'm doing what I'm doing now, uh, this podcasting and some other stuff, I think, because of my second Saturn return, mm -hmm, speaking mm -hmm. of Saturn. <laughs> tell me, tell me. Well, yeah, I got divorced and uh, quit my job and I started podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> All sorts of things happened within a time frame of maybe one and a half years. Yep. So, but I'm happy. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm coming up on my second Saturn return. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what's happen. What's going to happen? I know, Maybe you go to law school then. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, neither. Okay, to explain Jung's theories, his whole world would, of course, be an impossible task for a podcast episode like this. I mean, the personal unconscious, the collective unconscious, the archetypes, personality types and all. But to rationalize it a little bit, I understand that the same central component is what's called the individuation process uh, to become the person that one is intended to be uh, to become whole if you will mm -hmm. and to do that we need to recognize our what he called our anima and our animus and try to merge them is that is that correctly interpreted or what's the what's the deal with the animus and anima and is it the same thing as what we otherwise call masculine and feminine energy well okay so there's a lot in that question there's so I a could, lot yeah. <laughs> i could talk I'm about awful. individuation a little bit yes um which is you know this lifelong process of becoming whole and it requires i mean Jung talked about individuation in a couple of different ways that are all related But, but one of the ways I think that you're getting at is it's this development of the personality that happens over the course of a lifetime, which is one of the things that sets Jung apart as a theorist, because most psychoanalytic theorists were really focusing on personality development as a function of early childhood, which is very much Freud's take on it. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Eric Erickson, obviously, with his stages of development that across the lifespan is another example of someone who looked at growth across the lifespan. But this idea that we continue to grow and change and develop is is a pretty important idea. So it doesn't it doesn't stop once you're 18. In fact, some of the most important changes in, in, in the individuation process happen at midlife. So the yeah. stuff that you're you're talking about, these kinds of big personality I don't know if it's a personality shift, but it's a real change that happens even in later life. And I think intuitive, we all, we all see that. We're not the same person that we were when we were no, no, 15. You know? I mean, there's a core that's the same, yes. but I mean, we see, we see that core differently. We see our actions differently. Yes. So, um, so yeah. So an, an individuation does take a certain amount of um, openness to uh integrating things that had been in the unconscious. So um, it might be aspects of the shadow. And in fact, that would be a primary one. And of course the shadow was, was Jung's idea that there are these parts of our personalities that are sort of disallowed, you know, often by culture or a family, you know, in a sort of normal way. I mean, you can't, you can't go around bashing people on the head. 
you know, so when you're a little kid and you bash someone on the head, you know, your mom takes the toy away and scolds you and gives you a timeout, you know? Okay. But then your aggression kind of goes in the shadow, you know, as it, as it needs to, Mm. but lots of stuff winds up going in the shadow that, that might actually be, you know, helpful and important. Um, and, and that part of what happens over the course of development is that we reclaim that shadow stuff. So that, that's an aspect of individuation. And then you asked about anima and animus. So Jung felt that we, we were all sort of um, non-binary, if you will, that we all contain masculine and feminine elements, that every woman has within her a kind of psychological man, and every man has within him a sort of psychological woman. And that this was a really important aspect. It's both an archetype and a functional complex, is what Jung would say. And so the anima or the animus, um, one of the roles is that it's a it's a what Jung called a psychopomp, that which kind of leads into the interior. It it has a, a quality of fascination to it, and it's that aspect that we project onto the other when we fall in love. Um, you can't really integrate the anima or the animus because it's an into consciousness because it's an archetype. So you can't ever fully integrate it, but it is an important um, content to to come to terms with, to engage with, even to develop in a kind of conscious way. So that um, a woman is, you know, for psychological wholeness, should develop her masculine side. I'm going to use quotes. And a man should develop his feminine side. Now, this is so thorny because right away we're into sex role stereotypes. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, Jung died in 1961. He was born in 1875. You know, he, he lived at a time when we, we had a really different understanding of um, the sexes and their, and their roles, you know, in some sense, it's very traditional kind of Swiss married life, you know? Mm. Um, so, so it, it's thorny. And, and I, you know, you know, I think when we talk about qualities that are feminine and qualities that are masculine, there, there are probably some elements of that that are just uh, purely kind of cultural stereotypes. Yeah. But I think there might be some elements in there, too, that we could say, well, no, that that is more associated with women. Mm. Or that quality is, I mean, we know that men in general are more aggressive than women. Yeah. And we know, you know, there's a big body of research that shows that women tend to be more agreeable than men. Yeah. Now, is the, that the big five, the famous big five? Yes. They, they have tried, I mean, they have made down surveys and, yes. Just, as you yes. say, that agree, agreeableness is, is uh, bigger on, in women. Now, there's a question. <laughs> Are women more agreeable because we're socialized to be more agreeable? Yeah, that's that's, I mean, that's the yeah the, the follow up question that always comes when you talk right. about these things. Right, and 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 so so we're 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 off in the weeds right away with anima and animus. It's a very difficult topic to talk about because what are, what are we really saying here? I I'm um, I spent a lot of time trying to kind of parse this and think about it. And I don't know that I've sort of found anything really perfect about it, but I, I do. Th- well, it can be helpful sometimes to think about it as yin and yang. Mm-hmm. Well, that's basically the same kind of thinking, isn't it? Anima, animus, masculine, feminine, yin, yang. Isn't it the same saying the same thing with different terms? Yeah, but it's but yin and yang is less burdened by these cultural issues. That's that's true. So maybe so, it's more useful. Yeah. So sometimes I think that that's uh, because the, the main point here is that to to for people to understand is that we all have both within us. Yes. That's that's the basic knowledge here. That's the baseline. Yes. yes. But then and maybe maybe there is a dominance of the yin energy in in women on average, and on there's average. a dominance of yang energy in men on average. Yes. But but let's say for example scraping away the kind of masculine feminine language let's say that there is a woman who has a a lot of young energy and i know women like this young women who are really they're gunners they're aggressive they're confident you know which is great but over the course of her lifetime 
to become more whole, she'll have to develop more of that yin energy. And, and a man who's very kind of soft and, uh, you know, introverted and, uh, you know, very yin, um, to become more whole, he'll have to develop his yang energy. Yeah, that happens. I mean, it's, it's common. But I, I, as we said, we have to, in order to be able to talk about these things, whether, they're, whether it's a thing or not, really, you have to look yeah. at averages and, and the whole group, so to speak. I guess, but it's true, as you say, and there are lots of women that are more masculine than, than the average. Uh, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a thought that I have that I, I, I've mentioned a couple of times, and I, I need to try to sit down and develop this thought, but I don't know how to do it exactly. But if you listen to the podcast, you probably know that I'm a huge fan of the book, The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard about that book a lot. Um, a lot of people are talking about it in it's in an amazing esoteric book. podcasts. <laughs> it's great. It's yeah, really it's really such it. an amazing amazing book. Anyway, in it, um, Ian McGilchrist, you know, uses all of this kind of split brain uh, research. He, he looks at all of this kind of scientific research about brain and brain function to explore the reasons behind um, by hemispheric. That, like what's the nature of, of the different hemispheres of the brain? Like why is the brain uh, split into these two hemispheres? And over the course of evolution, it's gotten more split and more specialized. Like the two halves, there's a reason. Why do we have two halves? What are the two halves doing? Mm. And what does that mean for consciousness? Basically, that's the question that he explores. And he he talks about the, the right hemisphere in and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a hatchet job on this because, you know, there's so much in it. But the right hemisphere is, is implicit. It's uh, sort of the forest instead of the trees. It's mm-hmm. about context. It's yeah. about the whole thing. And people with um, left hemisphere deficits, like after a stroke or something, if you ask them to draw a flower, they will draw a pretty good flower. The left hemisphere is decontextualized, instrumental. It's interested in grasping, manipulating. It tends to see the parts instead of the whole. Someone with um, someone with a right hemisphere damage may not even understand that his. I'm getting all confused. That his arm (laughs) belongs to him or something. I mean. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really mucking up the research. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. Yeah, but he but sees an McGill- arm and he can't he, he can't see the context. He yeah, exactly. Arm. I can exactly. understand this is an arm, but it has nothing to do with me. Exactly. So, um, so McGilchrist posits that um, the, the 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 title refers to you know the master should be in charge, and he has this emissary without whom he can't do his job. But the the emissary, I think this is a story from Nietzsche the emissary has usurped the master and is now running the show. So the right hemisphere is the master. The left, yeah, the left hemisphere is the emissary. Our culture has gotten so tipped out of balance toward left hemispheric type thinking. Mm. And I wonder if when we say masculine, we're talking about something like the kind of consciousness that gets generated or awareness, let's say awareness that gets generated by the left hemisphere, mm-hmm. and when we say feminine in the psychological sense, mm-hmm. we're talking about something like the awareness that's generated by the right hemisphere. I'm curious. Yeah, that's super interesting, and and there there's a lot going for that theory, I think. But uh, I think there there has been quite a bit of brain research done, and well, it depends on where you read about these things because reporters of science are biased of course and they want to pinpoint the things that that talks for their theories Mm -hmm. so to speak but uh, as far as i understand there hasn't been very much there isn't very much evidence that women's brains are very different than men's Um, yeah no maybe that there are more there is a little bit more contact neurological contact between the hemispheres or something like that but not not much more than that I think. Right. That, no, that's true. That's true. There really, there really don't appear to be significant differences in, on balance. Oh, the, 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 it's such a contested area. It it's is. A, yeah. A really, yeah. Really and I mean, what is the brain anyway? It's just a TV set. I mean, the, the consci- consciousness isn't placed there. I think it's 
And, and I'm not trying to say that, ooh, women are all right-brained. I'm, I'm more talking about when we when we say that's the feminine in this Jungian sense, yeah. right? Of, I mean, we Jungians talk about the feminine all the time, and we don't mean women. Yeah. We mean no, the I can, feminine. I can, I can get that. And and I, I'm thinking, is that more sort of, are we talking about right brain consciousness or what, right brain awareness? Why not? So, it could be, could be, good, yeah. good, good point there. Yeah. So I, I was, I wanted to pinpoint to talk, uh, to focus on the animus and anima and, and feminine and masculine because I'm, I'm uh, uh, zeroing in here on, on the book that you've just come out with, I think. Yes. It's yes. pretty recent, isn't it? May? Yeah, it was. Um, May 25th in the United States, and actually just on Monday in the UK, on June, okay. 20, June 28th in the UK. Yeah, and I think I said in the mail to you that I, it's, it was on my reading list, which, is, which it is, but I haven't had time to read it. <laughs> I've only read the first chapter that's free online, that you can read okay. online, and, okay. and some comments around it, so I know a little bit. But it's called Motherhood, so let's talk about motherhood. And, sure. And it has, of course, has to do with this... Uh, Animal. Be shameless and just mm -hmm. show it. Yes, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So yes. Yeah, so so you, you just. Um, I mean, you have children. You, they're almost grown ups now. Mm -hmm. And you, I know you've you've said that the idea of writing this book came to you after having been a mother for a couple of years only. So tell us about that epiphany. What. What made you decide to write this book? Yeah, well, I was, I mean, I, I don't know that I decided to write it right away, but I was, um, I was in Jungian training and, um, uh, let's see, I started Jungian training when my daughter was uh, like 16 months old. Um, so, and that, you know, that was just so great. Like that first year in training, having this like gorgeous baby and wait, is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, but but then I was and then but then I was also pregnant, and uh, and and when baby number two came along, I had to take a, a leave from training, and um, and it was it was like it was really it was really wonderful having one baby, but having a baby and a toddler <laughs> sucked. It was yeah. really hard, yes. and um, and I you know I ugh, it was just everything about it. it was just really hard and so um at one one day you know I was just exhausted like just the, the level of sleep deprivation and oh my god and uh and so you know my kids used to wake up at like sometimes like literally 4 30 in the morning and then they'd just be awake yeah you know and it was Tell me about it. Oh, so it was like one of those mornings so by eight o'clock it's already been a long day mm -hmm. You know, and, and there's, and you still got 12 hours until bedtime, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and there, you know, there's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. I'd fed them breakfast. It's like, now what are we going to do, you know, for the next 12 hours? So I was like, all right, well, let's get in the stroller and go for a walk around the block, even though it was really, really cold out. Um, so it was, you know, December, it's freezing cold. And so I bundle them up, which of course takes forever. I, I, I put them in the double stroller, which of course is a big pain. And I'm, you know, pushing them down the sidewalk and the stroller, you know, getting stuck on the tree roots on the sidewalk and everything. And I just thought, damn, everything about this is so hard. Everything about this is so hard. And then this thought just came to my mind and the thought was, yes, and I'm changing so much as a result. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was in training, even though I was taking a year off, I was steeped in young. I was thinking about young all the time. And I thought, oh, this is an individuation experience. You had a so-called download, as some people call it. I guess, I guess. And it just, yeah. So I wanted to read more about that. Um, I was like, Ooh, where is, you know, who's written about that? So when the kids finally went down for their nap later, I got online and I'm, I'm looking and I couldn't find anything. So I, I just got really interested in it. There was stuff, there wasn't stuff written directly about it, but there was some stuff written around it, both by Jungians and by others. And so I started reading that. And eventually I, I ran some groups from others. And then um, when I wrote my thesis in analytic training on motherhood and shadow. And I knew when I was writing it, I had more to say and that it, and that it could really 
be applicable to the life of sort of ordinary women. It wasn't just the Jungian analysts who might be interested in this. Yeah. And so I knew I wanted to write the book. So I didn't start working on the book until after I finished analytic training. But yeah, in some sense, this has been gestating since 2004. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. But because, I mean, there are so many books written about, I mean, health books written about motherhood. So what was it that you thought that you could would be able to tell the world that wasn't already told in all these myriad health books? Right. Right. I mean, books about motherhood tend to either be, here's how to mother. Yeah. Or they tend to be kind of memoirs of motherhood, um, some of which are very funny and others of which are very oftentimes very literary. So I read a lot of um, a lot of memoirs of motherhood, actually, in doing the research for the book. Um, and I was interested, though, not in how to become a mother or how to let me say it again. I was interested not in how to become a better mother, you know, like how to deal with conflict with your kids or, you know, how to nurture yourself as your mothering or anything like that. I was really curious in what is the psychological process that I'm going through? What, how is this an opportunity for self growth? What, what is it we're steeping in when we're doing this? What are we learning? How is it a, an individuation process? That's what I wanted to talk about. And, and I you, don't you, think there are many books like it. No, I don't think so either. I think you wrote somewhere that we, do, we in the West, we don't really have initiation uh, rituals anymore, mm -hmm. uh, if we ever had them. But life has its own initiation, uh, yeah, initiation processes, so to speak. And I mean, this is probably one of the most challenging in initiation processes that life can, can offer. Yeah. Being a mother. I mean, if you, if you really want to learn more about yourself, relationships are the best way to do that. And perhaps the relationship that is most likely to catalyze self-awareness and self-knowledge is parenthood. Mm -hmm. Because it's so hard. It doesn't go away. It's unrelenting. And the stakes are really high. Yeah. You can't walk away. And it really matters. And so you you dig in and you you give it everything you got. And then and then it's like, wow, I didn't know I had that in me. Really? I had that in me? Both good stuff and bad stuff. Yeah. I mean, one of the quotes that I use in the book that I really love is um, Faye Weldon, the novelist, says, one of the best things about not having children is that you can go on thinking of yourself as a nice person. <laughs> So, and, and I, that is absolutely true. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Is that you don't, I don't think, well, I, I know it's true for me and I think it's true for most women, probably maybe most fathers too. I had no idea of my capacity for rage. That's exactly what I was going to yeah, mention. I remember that when I was, when, when I, our kids were, were young, I got so angry and I'm not an angry person. Yeah. I, I never, I, I was never angry, but I, it just bubbled up. It's uh, yeah. Incredible. Like shocking. Like I, I can remember some of the things that I thought and felt and, and, and it's, it's shocking to me that I thought and felt those things in a way. It's like, really, you know, I guess it's not shocking anymore, but it was really shocking at the time. <laughs> See, now I know, now I know I'm capable of that. And that's individuation. It's like, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm capable of homicidal feelings. Yeah. I get that. <laughs> I can go there. Be friends with your shadow. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a good thing. Then you don't have to be afraid of the shadow anymore because you know it's there and you have these this capacity and you can just learn to live with it and you kind of well, yeah, diffuse, a little bit. Diffuse, it, diffuse it a, a bit. A, a little, I mean, I think it's complicated because you can't ever really integrate, fully integrate the shadow. You can integrate some of it. Um, I think it's it's not quite as warm and fuzzy as we'll be friends with it and then it's diffused because the truth is now that I now I know I have homicidal, you, you know it's like it's like, you know all that is human is mine mm -hmm. right we're we're all capable of all things and yeah. you think oh no I could never I could never kill I could never you know kill someone but it's like you have kids like oh yeah yeah I know that urge I know that urge 
And, and it's like, okay, now I know that. And in some ways it's, it's less dangerous because I know it, but it's not like it's been entirely, you know, we have to respect the shadow. We can't, we can't get too arrogant about it. Yeah. What about, what about the fathers then? Uh, and this, this is maybe where it gets thorny again, but uh, this experience of being a mother is very special, of course, because I mean, the woman carries the baby and, and delivers it and all that, that a man can't do that, but a man can be a father and fatherhood is part of, to some extent, it, it entails the same experiences, but not exactly. So what would you say, to what extent can a man experience these things that you're describing in the book, Motherhood? I think that probably a lot of it is relevant to fathers. I mean, that's not the book I wrote and it's, that's not my experience. And it's not, you know, most of my experience in my practice is with mothers. I, I I've certainly worked with some fathers and I think especially fathers who are the primary caregiver, you know, the stay at home caregiver. Mm -hmm. I think that in that case, the, you know, it's, it's especially noted, notable how close it is. Um, so I, I I imagine it's mostly similar and there may be some things that are, are different. And I think that book should be written too. And it's probably not going to be me who writes it. <laughs> so I hope someone writes that yeah. book. Yeah. There's a need for that. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so going to read it at some point. Uh, <laughs> so now it's available, I guess, uh, on online. And yes. <clears throat> uh, yeah. You, you, we talked a little bit about this. I mean, the possible differences between, men and women, male and female, and so so we, we don't have to del dive deeper into that now. But I was I wanted to ask you about a very specific thing around gender that is happening now. And and, and it's it's a bit odd, I think. I had I had a guest the other week on the podcast who talked about these things because he's she's written a book. She's a Swedish debater and writer and she's written a book about this the new look upon gender and what gender is gender and sex and there's there's a change going on and there's there's been an explosion in the number of children mainly girls who are diagnosed with so-called gender dysphoria mm -hmm. and so they feel that they are another sex than their body uh, indicates that they are uh, well at least they say this and and um this the development has many psychological layers, of course. I, you've written a scientific article that Carl Gustav Jung would probably call this gender shakeup, a psychic epidemic. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, you know, Jung uh, lived through both world wars. So he was very familiar with um, the potential destructive capacity of the spread of ideas, I want to say, you know, ideas are very powerful things, and they can be very dangerous things, they can be very positive things too. But, um, you know, an, an idea or an ideology like National Socialism, you know, mm -hmm. can do a lot of damage. Um, and I'm, I'm not, uh, so, so, so he was very, he wrote at some length about what he called psychic epidemics, and um, and their potential danger. He was very mistrustful of kind of um, mass psychology. And, uh, you know, this is sort of in line with uh, what's often referred to as social contagion. And we know that just about everything is socially contagious. We know that happiness is socially contagious. We know that weight gain is socially contagious. There's a book called Strange Contagion that came out a few years ago. Unfortunately, right now I cannot remember the author, but it's a it's a great book and it kind of catalogs all of this. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of research behind all of this too. And it's, you know, it's used in, for example, public health campaigns. You know, we know that we can sort of spread healthy ideas about about um, smoking. Mm -hmm. You know, through through the use of the right kind of uh, um, messaging. Um, if you uh, if you have a friend who gets divorced, you're more likely to get divorced. And and this, fired. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and and uh, so just about any human quality, mm. any kind of social 
quality, subjective quality can, can be spread. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that, that catalogs all of our mental health ails, it does not take into account uh, social elements but but depression is is contagious and and this has been now um, studied in terms of how it can be spread online yeah through social media networks you know it's like if you have a friend who's, everything spins faster these days so it's, mm-hmm. it's so so I you know I I, I don't think that it, it it should at all be a far flung possibility to wonder about whether. Part, the rise in young teen girls um, with gender dysphoria might in part be mediated by social factors. To me, yeah. that seems like a, a kind of common sense question to ask. Probably plausible. But then the question is, why is society at large uh, uh, supporting this? And, uh, you know... Um, What's, what's the re- what's the, the yeah we're you know well I think behind that is that is that as we were talking about before left hemisphere right hemisphere brain is this a more more of a left hemisphere brain thing that you don't have the 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 holistic approach to this I have wondered that it's a bit technical isn't it just, okay yes, so I you have. feel that you are a woman but you're in a man's body then you of course that's has to be correct so we have to change that we have to Well, it's a concretization. Yeah. It's a concretization. And to go back to what you raised in the beginning about, you know, the nature of anim anonymous and whatever we think about that. You know, the importance of engaging with whatever part of us might be, you know, represented by the the, the masculine or the feminine. Um, you know, if if you're a if you're a, a yin person and you feel a, a kind of urge to explore your young side, that's great. But why is it getting concretized in changes to the body? Yeah. You know, that, that ought to be a sort of psychological and a psychological process. And, and in, including like, maybe you want to make changes to how you dress. Mm-hmm. Maybe you want to make, maybe, maybe you feel an, a, a desire to express a different part of your personality and you want to, you know, change careers and um, do something that's typically associated with the other sex. I mean, you know, the, there are real ways to live this out. Um, that exactly. are creative and life-giving. But if you have um, surgery, there's no way back. So that, a... yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that that body bodily changes are always wrong. I mean, another thing about a Jungian frame on things is like it's it's very difficult to pinpoint any absolute. It's like what what the self might want of any person is not really for me to judge. Mm. And there, there, I, I, I know there are people who will need to make these changes in order to live their lives out mo- most fully. And I, I support that. Um, but, but I think I want to take it back to your question is like, so, so this is a complex phenomenon and could we approach it with, with nuance and, and why, why, why do those dis- discussions tend to get shut down? And I think the reason is partly that um you know, in, in mental health and, in uh, psychology and psychiatry people, you know, it was, it was, uh, very homophobic and, uh, um, being, being a homosexual was considered to be, uh, you know, a, a pathology until yeah. quite recently. And it's I think a lot of us, seven, nine, I think. Yeah. I think a lot of us are ashamed of that yeah. and we want to make sure we don't make the same mistake. And so we don't want to pathologize anything. We, we want to welcome it and 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 so but it but it can lead to a, a kind of self-censoring i think where, where we don't let ourselves just kind of ask questions of like okay you know could, could there be multiple explanations for what's going on yeah. could it be because i mean they're things? so young these these children they're i mean they're just 10 11 12 years old so what's the problem with waiting a few years till they get older and can And, and listen, in the United States, this has gotten incredibly polarized and politicized. So, um, you know, to say, well, they're really young. Could we wait in the United States often gets subsumed under this uh, really reprehensible 
drive to use these issues to create a wedge and in, in, in the in the culture war. And there are these bills that are um, being proposed in several Republican majority states in the United States to to make these treatments illegal for for youth. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think that's ever a good idea for the government to get involved. And that's the other extreme. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but that right. doesn't mean there also aren't real questions to ask. And I know that Sweden has recently changed their guidance on treating adolescents with gender dysphoria, at least at a couple of big institutions. If I think, I think the Karolinska Institute has has now said, you know, we're not going to kind of follow what's known as the Dutch protocol. The Dutch protocol, yeah, that's that's right. We were talking about Kaisa Ekis Ekman, the, the guest that I was mentioning before, who wrote a book book about this. She, yeah, she talked. She mentioned that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Yeah. So there's been, you know, Sweden, Finland, and the UK have all kind of said, wait a minute, after extensive reviews of evidence, mm. we're going to be more cautious. Yeah. So that's good, I think. Uh, so what about other psychic epidemics? Uh, do you see any other? Oh my God, they're, they, you know, once you look at things this way, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, I how mean, do we, for instance, handle? Uh, it's not completely over, but how have we so far handled the pandemic, for instance? Yeah, I've I've heard um, I've heard some people express uh, concerns that um, so-called long COVID might might be a kind of uh, one of these uh, phenomenon phenomena like this. Now, and I, I don't I'm not prepared to weigh in on that either way. I mean, it's sort of a question, but mm. but I'll, I'll tell you um, another really good example that's in the book that I mentioned, Strange Contagion, is um, uh, um, bulimia. Yeah. There's a really, there's a really great explanation of bulimia in, in, the, in the book and how that became contagious. And I'm gonna try to see if I can summarize it really quickly and I hope I don't get too many of the details wrong. Um, so, it was very rare, very, very rare. And then a psychiatrist in the UK wrote up a couple of case reports about these women who would overeat and then vomit. And he wrote up a couple of case reports, published it in a scientific journal. And then the popular magazine, Marie Claire, wrote up something based on his scientific article. And then after the Marie Claire article, there were more and more and more cases. And within a few years, there were millions of cases all over the world. Wow. You know, and it's, it when, wasn't when just was from this, the one article. This, this article, when was it published? Um, Like maybe the 70s, I, I don't know. But, and it wasn't obviously just the Marie Claire article, right? The Marie Claire started it and then other people picked up. So there's this interaction with the media yeah. that we can spread these ideas. And, and I'm not saying that people with bulimia weren't genuinely suffering. It's just that they, they, this is the way their psyche chose to express the suffering. Mm. But once we know that the psyche is that susceptible to suggestion, how we respond to things <clears throat> like bulimia can really shift whether or not it spreads or is contained. And, and, you know, it, it would be better if it didn't spread. <laughs> of course. And talking about uh, long COVID, I mean, uh, regardless whether this is uh, a real real illness or, or if it's perceived, it, one can say that uh, the fear that has spread uh, during this pandemic is ki- a kind of psychic epidemic, perhaps. I mean, the fear of... yes. Yes, itself because it's not. A, I mean, the virus isn't isn't extremely dangerous. It's dangerous to some risk groups, very old people, and some other groups. But to most people, it's not that very dangerous. Really. But people have been panicking all over the world. There's a sound there behind you. I have no idea what that is. Okay, <laughs> it just went away. Good. It came back. I yeah, I don't know what it is. It's out there somewhere. Okay, never mind. So. The fear around this pandemic would you would you would you um, describe that as a? As yeah, a- it's hard because I, I think that that the fear around the pandemic is is tricky because I, I agree that people have been that some people who probably shouldn't 
didn't need to panic, maybe panicked. Mm -hmm. But but I also think that this is a very particular thing because it's like a public health issue mm. that requires a, a public health response, which means, you know, even though I don't believe I was particularly susceptible to um, getting very sick, for example, I, you know, I'm healthy and I'm not that old and I'm a woman, so I, you know. Um, I still had to participate in all of the, you know, in, in the, you know, social distancing and mask wearing and all of that stuff in order to protect other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so a certain amount of, um, it's a strange thing because the public health messaging, I think did kind of cultivate a certain amount of fear that maybe was unwarranted, but, but perhaps we all needed to have a certain level of vigilance to keep each other safe on a population level, you know, so it's, it's tricky. I know it's it's not easy to. I, I my opinion is that fear is our greatest enemy in most contexts, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can understand the reasoning behind scaring people in order to, to 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 make them to have them behave in certain ways. And so it's the same with the the climate issue, for instance. Uh, well, anyway, it's that's a side topic. We, we're not going to dive into that. Exciting. Now, we're in a, I'm not going to take much more of your, your time here, but I have a couple of questions more that I want to ask you. Uh, we are, I mean, the world is integrating for the first time now in recorded history, and we are, we know in real time what's happening on the other side the, of, of the planet, which has never happened before, as far as we know. Yeah, do, do you see that, we are, are we living in a time where, time of faster and deeper change than before? And I mean, seeing humanity as a collective psyche and analyzing it as a union. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think I, I tend to be a little pessimistic about some of the changes because I think that um, there's a way that our instincts, which are so important and so important, uh, the instincts are very important to Jung, can be... Um, kind of co-opted and we can be, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about social media, right? The way that we can be um, stirred up and um, kind of whipped up into a frenzy, this thing here and that thing there, and and the, the, the sort of the speed of things and the way it's connected, but it it only kind of touches in, I think, as far as I can tell so far, maybe, maybe, maybe not, you know? But to a fairly superficial level, that 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 I think I think there's some. I think I think there's a danger to this. There there certainly are also probably benefits, but I don't. I think to, we've to only the just. Integration, you mean to the integration that we see? To, I'm thinking of social media in particular. Okay. I I don't think we really fully understand yet, and I don't think we will for probably several decades. How. Um, the effect of the effect of the internet and social media on our psyches yeah. and and what it what it means that ideas can spread so so quickly but the collective unconscious maybe grows in a way and it gets more accessible to everyone and it i'm just i'm just guessing here well i you know the the collective unconscious. I don't. I I think the collective unconscious. My my guess would be. I guess I sort of have an old fashioned view of it. But the collective unconscious is just there, and it doesn't yeah. matter what's doesn't matter, no. you know. It doesn't matter if there's social media or not. It's there, and we're we're connected as we've always been at that level. And the question is, can that kind of keep us together enough while there's while the stuff on top is kind of fraying. That's true. Well, I guess social media, the technical aspect of social media, or it is a technical thing, is more like a B version of the, the, the Akashic Records or something, because mm -hmm. after all, we yeah. probably have access to, to the knowledge that we need to access anyway, if we're just capable of going deep enough. Do you think the, would you say that the individuation process is the same thing as, as a spiritual awakening? No, not the same. No. no, Jung said that the point of individuation was wholeness, not perfection. And I, I think that, um, I mean, there may be spiritual aspects of individuation. I think that's true. 
Mm. But I think individuation, if I can just put it very plainly, is just getting to know more of yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and final question. When I read the, the first chapter there in your book, there, there's, um, it, the book is, is, um, is um, written around fairy tales. You have a special interest in fairy tales, and I can understand why, because they're, they are peppered with archetypes, of course. And in this first chapter, there's the fairy tale of the two caskets. Mm -hmm. uh, not to go deeply into the details uh, about how it plays out, but it's uh, one conclusion is that if you're open, curious, and kind, life opens up little by mm -hmm. little. And if you're selfish and have a closed mind, you'll end up in a more miserable state. Yeah. This sounds a little bit like the so-called, not a little bit, it sounds much like the so-called law of attraction. I think you've heard about that. It's, it's used a lot in the spiritual and new age community. Does it work that way, you think? Well, I mean, I, I don't know a lot about the law of attraction, but I think it's, you know, the thing about things like the law of attraction is there's some truth in it, but it's, it's also overly simplified and, and sort of, I'm almost going to say kind of commodified, mm. you know? Um, but there's, there's, there's some truth in it that, that how the world, how the world finds us or how the world treats us has to do with how we meet the world. And, and some of that is just kind of common sense. I mean, if, if you, if you, let's just take a, an example that you arrive at a party where you don't know anyone, if you go there and your face is open and you're smiling and you're assuming people are going to like you and then, you know, you're probably going to leave having at least had a few good conversations where if you go in and you're grumpy and assume everyone at the party is a boring idiot, then you probably are not going to have a very good time. So, I mean, that's kind of a silly example, but if you multiply that out into life and, 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 and especially how you look at yourself, I mean, if you see yourself as a kind of a, an interesting, interesting subject worthy of study. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the big things that I talk about a lot in the book. I mean, that's maybe the, the underlying messages you yell at your kids, you yell at your kids. Okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Get curious about it. What what does that mean? Why did that happen? And what does that mean? And where does that want to go? And what does that say about you? And what could you learn from that? You know, you you um, you know, my wish is that we would all find ourselves very interesting, and be curious about ourselves, and that I think helps life open up. Beautiful. Lisa Marciano, where can people find you and your work? You, you have a website? Yes, my website is lisamarciano.com. It's my author website. And the podcast is thisjungianlife.com. Beautiful. Thank you for this lovely conversation, Lisa, and good luck with your Jungian journey. Thank you. Your writing and your podcasting. Thanks.